Greetings and welcome to Coffee Breaks with Scholars, a series of research and scholarship-informed conversations between diversity scholars and experts on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today's conversation will focus on Asian American Pacific Islander, or AAPI, voter engagement and what research and scholarship tell us about Asian Americans and the upcoming 2020 national election. Coffee Breaks with Scholars is presented by the Diversity Scholars Network and the National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan. Our coffee break today features Dr. Melissa Borja, Assistant Professor of Asian Pacific Islander American Studies at the University of Michigan, Dr. Oyan Poon, Program Officer at the Spencer Foundation, Affiliated Associate Professor of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Chicago at Illinois, and Faculty Affiliate of Higher Education Leadership at Colorado State University. Dr. Janelle Wong, Professor of Asian American Studies and Government and Politics at the University of Maryland, and Dr. Russell Jung, Professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University and founder of the Stop AAPI Hate Project. I will now turn it over to our scholars to kick off this conversation about AAPI voter engagement. Hi, my name is Melissa Borja. I'm assistant professor in the Department of American Culture at the University of Michigan, where I'm also a core faculty member in the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program. I'm really excited to have this conversation today with friends and colleagues about this really fascinating topic, Asian American Pacific Islanders and voter engagement. And we can't have had a better week to have this discussion considering some of the um, recent news developments. Um, so a little bit about me and then I guess we'll all talk a little bit about ourselves before we jump into discussion. Um, I'm a historian of immigration, religion, Asian American life and politics in the United States. Currently finishing a book manuscript on refugee policy and its impact on the religious lives of Hmong refugees. Um, and starting a new project this year, which is a religious history of American immigration policy. So lots I'm happy to talk about, but I know our conversation today is going to be about political engagement. So here are some things I'm really interested in discussing. Um, this election, of course, less than 100 days away, Asian Americans' role in it. Um, I'm interested in thinking historically about these unprecedented times. We often say these times are unprecedented, and in many ways they are. I'm thinking a lot about what precedents do exist to the things that we're experiencing now. And that's where I'm, I'm putting on my historian hat. Um, but I'm also a Midwesterner. I'm born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan. I currently live in Indiana. And I'm really interested in thinking about how all of these issues about Asian Americans and political engagement look differently in different parts of the country. Um, so here I'm thinking about these issues also as a an organizer, an activist, in addition to my role as a scholar. Um, and, I, and I think we can probably have lots to discuss. Hi, everyone. I'm Professor Russell Jung. I'm chair and professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State. And I also, um, during the pandemic, helped found Stop API Hate. It's a tracker um, recording firsthand accounts of how Asian Americans have faced discrimination during this period. So we have over 2,500 cases. And for me, um, I'm really excited to be here to talk um, with friends and colleagues as well and thank Megan and um, this opportunity to, to talk about these issues. Um, so my concerns are 75% of Asian Americans now fear racial bias because of the pandemic. How does that impact how they vote, especially when um, the Republican administration continues to use terms like the Chinese virus and mock um, the Chinese language by talking about the Kung flu. Um, related is because of the coronavirus, um, China has been blamed for it and US-China relations has entered a Cold War stage. So um, both parties are poising themselves as being hard on China and China bashing then leads to the bashing of Chinese in the US and Asians in the US. So my other concern and question is, how do Asian Americans orientations towards the homeland, towards US-China relations impact how they vote and see candidates in terms of their um, foreign policies? Um, and finally, I guess my third question would be, um, 
Asian American Republicans are now put in a really difficult position um, when they hear their own elected officials um, mocking them, casting them as perpetual foreigners, um, saying we like working with them because we um, are in control, but we appreciate their um, and the us them the binary their help. So thanks, and looking forward to the discussion. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. And thank you to Megan for organizing. And uh, it's fun to see everyone's faces. My name is Janelle Wong, and I am a professor at the University of Maryland in the departments of political science and American studies. And I'm a core faculty member in Asian American studies. I'm a survey researcher and study Asian American public opinion. I've also done some work on religion and uh, Asian Americans uh, that has brought me together with Russell and with Melissa in the past. Um, and I've been active around the Asian Americans in Affirmative Action debate, which brings me into close contact with Dr. Kuhn. Um, the questions that I'm interested in is are have to do with the mobilization and lack of mobilization of Asian Americans in the election. We often see that Asian Americans don't aren't contacted in the election until the few weeks, and we're here, before the election, and that the campaigns often get that outreach, I think, wrong because of assumptions that they have about our community. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. And I'll turn it over to Oyen. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. I greatly appreciate Megan, Melissa, the NCID for holding this coffee break conversation. Um, and uh, so my name is Oyan Poon. I am a program officer at the Spencer Foundation and an associate professor affiliate at uh, the University of Illinois Chicago's Department of Educational Policy Studies. Um, anyway, <laughs> there's a lot of, lot of titles. That's not good. Um, and um, just really exciting to be here in conversation with everybody. Um, uh, you know, I think the questions that are on my mind, especially this week, the day after the Trump and Barr Department of Justice came out with their decision um, in their investigation into race conscious admissions at Yale, is how this will propagate further misinformation and racial anxieties among Asian American voters. I know that on WeChat, which is primarily used with, among the Chinese diasporic community. There's just a lot of falsehoods and myths about race conscious admissions policies. And we know that um, generally, I, you know, I think about my late advisor and mentor, Don Nakanishi, who would often say education politics is the galvanizing really big kind of the, the match that lights a lot of mobilization, political mobilization, civic engagement among Asian American communities. And so um, we're here 80 days, is it 80 days before November 2020 election? <sighs> um, deep breath. And, um, you know, I'm really fearful and wondering how we can disrupt um, the mismaking um, and the instigation of racial anxiety um, amongst Asian American voters. Um, in California because we have Prop 16 this year in November, but also more nationally, it was no coincidence that the Yale DOJ decision came out yesterday. Um, as uh, we know from the work of Janelle and other political scientists that um, Asian Americans are becoming an influential, you know, relatively small group of voters, but still can make a difference, particularly in tight elections. And so, have lots of questions and worries and concerns and really looking forward to having this conversation. So maybe I could try to paint the big picture, try to connect the dots of, of some of our issues. So overall, Asian Americans are considered a possible swing vote. Um, we're not likely voters, um, oftentimes because we're new citizens, we're immigrants, um, and because of that, um, the political parties don't really reach out to us because we're not likely voters. Um, but 
<clears throat> we are used as a wedge issue group. So for example, when um, we are in the midst of the pandemic upsurge and Black Lives Matters uprisings, Trump pivoted towards blaming China for the coronavirus and just attacked China to distract and to um, divert attention away from those other issues. In the same way, in affirmative action, Asian Americans are used as a wedge, um, saying it hurts whites and Asians, affirmative action hurts whites and Asians, and therefore we should get rid of um, <clears throat> affirmative action. So, in these two cases, Asian Americans are the wedge issue, and the Asian Americans and their concerns are the wedge issue, sometimes to divert attention, sometimes to scapegoat. Um, what would galvanize Asian American voters, though, um, what Oyan just pointed out, are our are, are concern, our are domestic issues like education, our opportunities, healthcare, um, and now increasingly anti Asian hate. Um, again, like I said, Three out of four Asian Americans fear racial bias. One third to two thirds say they have actually experienced it. And in a study um, my campaign internship program did, they interviewed a thousand Asian American young adults, and 80% said their first reaction um, to anti Asian racism is anger. So you don't think of Asian Americans as being an angry electorate, but they are. And Asian Americans are the group most likely to support Black Lives Matter after African Americans. I think this, un, this recognition that Asians are being racially profiled and that African Americans are um, suffering through the criminal justice system, um, Asian Americans are easily putting together those points to, to recognize how racist and unequal the United States is. So, um, so again, the big picture is Asian Americans aren't likely to vote usually because we're, we don't get the attention from political parties, that's Janelle's research, um, were used as a wedge issue in affirmative action and the scapegoating of China. And, um, but we are now an angry, highly racially conscious, and actually a strong voting block now for the Democratic Party at the moment nationally. I wanna jump in and, and talk a little bit about this issue of anti-Asian hate because uh, like Russell, I'm one of the researchers working with the Stop API Hate um, Reporting Center, and it's been really amazing to be part of that really powerful project. And one thing that I think is really interesting is to think about the multiple ways that particular issue can engage people. It may not be the case that it is the primary issue that gets people to vote a particular way, although it could be. But what I'm seeing on the ground in places like Indiana and in Michigan, it is at least a spurring a lot of organizing and the formation of new um, energy, new, new committees. And I am seeing a type of uh, political activity around that issue that people like Helen Zia and other um, Asian American leaders in Michigan liken to what they saw in their early 80s um, with, with the murder of Vincent Chin. So I think if we think about this issue as being a potentially galvanizing issue like the murder of Vincent Chin um, and it having long-term effects both in the creation of new institutions, um, commitments. I think we can imagine political possibilities beyond this fall. So what I'm really encouraging people to do is you know, not just limit our understanding of Asian American political engagement as being whether or not they show up to the polls, which I hope they do, but whether or not they are showing up to city council meetings and demanding that their mayors issue statements condemning anti-Asian hate, that they're demanding that Asian Americans have a place um, on advisory commissions at their universities or in their state governments. And so I think there's a lot of possibility in this moment. You both raised so many great topics that we can follow up on and build on. And I just want to talk a little bit and add to this conversation, um, you know, this kind of long-term trend that Asian Americans are not recruited to take part in politics. So a lot of times, you know, we look at these rates of participation across different racial groups and Asian Americans and Latinos are actually um, very similar in terms of their 
they're, they're often categorized as low propensity voters, as Russell mentioned. And, and this is for several reasons. Um, of course, we are still a very um, small segment of the population relative to other groups. So we're about 6% of the US population, 4% of the electorate. And um, so being very small and being concentrated in um, predominantly blue states, I think like over 60% of the Asian American population is in these like kind of blue states um, and in places like Texas that are more swing, they tend to be in bluer areas. Um, those things are true, but I think what really uh, keeps us from having a robust voice in American politics is the fact that political parties and candidates too quickly write us off as in some ways caring only about issues like affirmative action and being apathetic. And that assumption then leads to this vicious cycle where we're not asked to participate in politics. And when you're not asked to participate in politics, you then uh, participate less. There's a lot of data showing like not being asked is one of the reasons why uh, we don't participate at high rates. And so there's this vicious cycle of related to where we live uh, and the fact that candidates and parties think that we don't care about politics. And this has been the uh, cycle that we see election after election. Um, and it, it, I think, highlights some fundamental misunderstanding about our community. So the one fundamental misunderstanding is that we're like culturally not not interested in politics, that we care more about like putting uh, food on the table and advancing our um, academic, uh, you know, numbers. When in fact, you can look around the world and Asians around the world have, are, are very active, are protesting around the world, right? But there is this assumption that even our sometimes Asian American elected officials buy into that we're an apathetic community. But there's so that's one thing that I think is really critical that our the reasons that we are participating at lower rates than other groups in politics is it's really both structure and stereotypes where we're concentrated. And because these are not swing states that we're concentrated in often and that is changing as Melissa noted, but also the stereotypes that affect our communities. But there's also the way that we experience outreach so politicians and candidates and the two parties are like, okay, it's a few weeks before the election. How should we reach out to Asian Americans? They're like, mm, okay, they're mostly immigrants. Let's reach out on immigration policy, okay? But in fact, Asian Americans look a lot like the general population when it comes to immigration. Research I've done shows that, for instance, Black Americans are actually more progressive on both undocumented immigration issues and on legal immigration than Asian Americans. Then parties are like, well, okay, well, we know they care about education because they also fall into this trap of the model minority stereotype. But of course, education policy is really divisive in our across our communities. What these parties don't get is that there actually is an Asian American agenda out there. Where do Asian Americans look distinct when it comes to policy attitudes? They're more likely than the general population to support universal health care. They love Obamacare, right? They are more likely to support gun control than the general population. They're more likely to be environmentalists than the general population. When was the last time we heard about Asian Americans as environmental voters, right? Nobody ever reaches out to us on those issues. They're more likely to support big government programs and redistributive tax schemes, despite this idea that we're really conservative on taxes. And so the parties are getting it wrong. And I think that creates like a disconnect between Asian Americans and uh, campaigns. I'll turn it over to William. I want to go back to something we were talking about. I really appreciate Melissa, you pointing out um, how civic engagement in, in Asian American politics goes beyond the ballot box, right? Um, and Russell, you also pointed out, you know, that Asian Americans were a racially conscious population. Um, I think I, 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 the question that is on my mind, and as I write, forever write this book that continues to be the bane of my existence, um, 
you know, racially conscious in what ways is my a deeper concern that when we say racially conscious, I think there's at least two ways that I'm noticing Asian Americans move in. Um, in some regards, some segments of the population, like some Chinese conser racially conservative immigrant activists in Seattle, Washington, they've been marching with the Proud Boys, an avowed hate group, um, to oppose affirmative action. Um, so I'm seeing it, it, there's this thread of Chinese ethnic nationalism happening in one regard, like they're racially conscious. They feel aggrieved racially in this country, but their response has been to merge in with really troubling nationalistic movements, which I think, Russell, you know, you've been talking about global relations, and I think there's something there, and I haven't looked deeply into it yet. But then in the other regard, and the, the, I think the racial conservatives, as Janelle likes to call them, um, they get a lot of media attention because it's a complete spectacle of like, whoa, look at this racially minoritized population opposing affirmative action or opposing ethnically disaggregated data. Um, so we can identify racial and ethnic disparities as a problem for policy to address. Like there's this really odd spectacle happening there with this ethnic nationalism happening. The other response that I've seen has been very much um, in alignment with movements for Black Lives, right? A more racially just, a much more racially um, movement for racial coalition, for racial equity and injustice that is different. It, it, they're both very vibrant responses, um, vigorous responses, and I think I'm working on that intro, Janelle, it will come next week. <laughs> um, but it's really this question of like, I think there's a battle over the heart and soul of Asian America right now and what it means to be Asian American in this country and what race means. And then also in relationship, what we do as Asian Americans, how is that going to affect and influence racial politics in this country? Um, but in terms of the ballot box and electoral politics, as Janelle was just talking about, I'm really concerned that we're going to start seeing Asian American voters that vote against their own interests. Um, that yesterday's DOJ announcement, pronouncement, such problematic logic in their decision on Yale, um, is going to confuse things and um, folks are, there's going to be a segment of the population who feel like, yes, especially in this COVID moment, I am definitely seeing anti-Asian racism. And now the DOJ is saying that Yale is discriminating against Asian Americans. And so that must mean I am against affirmative action. That must mean the Republican Party is for me, never mind that they just use terms like Kung Flu um, and the Chinese virus that has led to all this violence um, blatant violence against Asian Americans, as, as Russell and Melissa have been documenting. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm really nervous and wondering if there's any way to slow the roll a little bit or disrupt or and what questions then come up from all of this. And, and I recognize that I'm totally just talking out loud right now and, and just worried. Yeah, I think that's a good way to, um, to try to understand what is the racial consciousness of Asian Americans. Um, both on the left and on the right, they feel aggrieved, they feel they're facing discrimination, and but they're approaching it in different ways, right? Um, so on the left side, we're siding with Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> um, and and we're, we're sort of saying it's the second generation who grew up in America and the older generations who grew up during the civil rights movement who are more inclined that way. And we sort of paint the picture of Asian American conservatives as being recent immigrants who are professionals um, from Asia, used to conservative orientations, maybe resisting <coughs> um, authoritarian governments, but liking them still. <laughs> and, um, and then for Chinese, at least having this sort of Han superiority orientation that we made it and we want to support a meritocratic system. Um, and so, so having that Han 
superiority complex sort of aligns with white supremacy saying, well, you know, some groups deserve to be below us because they don't work as hard. Um, and I don't know, I, I think in some ways I feel like, wow, are we painting the picture too easily and even more complex than saying it's a generational divide and a divide in um, where people come from and a class divide? Russell, you brought up a lot of internal divisions. I mean, multiple people have. Uh, class, generation, uh, home country if they're immigrants. Um, I brought up region. I think what this all points to is just how hard it is to mobilize and organize and reach out to a community that is so internally diverse. And I think just remembering that uh, the category of Asian American is still relatively new. And a lot of the people I'm talking to don't even really use the term Asian American. They use Filipino American, they use Indian American. We can't even get um, mainstream newspapers to use the word Asian American. They're more inclined to use an ethnic identifier than a broad category like Asian American. I definitely noticed that in the news coverage of Kamala Harris. Um, so I, I feel like that is just a fundamental issue over and over again is this category of Asian American is really unstable. Um, and it's artificial, but it's also really important and useful. Um, so how do we use this category uh, and mobilize and organize and also honor the differences that exist within Asian America? I find that really, really hard. And I, and I really speak about this issue very passionately just because, um, you know, in many ways, I feel like my own experiences as an Asian American are not really represented in the stories that are centered in academia, um, on, in national media. You know, I am a Midwestern, uh, Catholic, you know, working class, Southeast Asian girl. That is not a story that you usually see uh, in stories about Asian Americans. And so um, I think a lot of Asian Americans really feel like the Asian American agenda, however that is constructed, doesn't really speak to them. Those are such great points. And I, I think it's important to remind ourselves that the Asian American population is constantly developing and the, the borders of our own uh, population are fluid and changing. And here's the empirical kind of evidence for that is that over the last 10 years, we've seen the Asian American population demographically change such that, you know, it's that East Asians who dominate the story of Asian America are really a minority of the broader Asian American population. The, <laughs> the majority of the population is South Asian and Southeast Asian. And few people know that. And that's why the story gets told the way that it is told. I also wanted to just reiterate or just comment on Russell's point that this is a, um, a, a simplified story often and it can we can make it more complex I mean and I've used that simplified story before you know there is a generational divide in Asian America there's no doubt when we look at public opinion that across different national origin groups younger people are more progressive on every single issue than are the older generation that is true. At the same time, what gets lost in that narrative is that older Asian Americans are more progressive than white Americans. So this is lost. We're always talking about, you know, the conservative um, older first generation, but actually that generation is, is, is racially conservative in many ways but progressive on a lot of issues like the role of government in American life. And that is why we see a consolidation with the Democratic Party. You know, despite of all of that, the important divides in our community and the internal diversity that Melissa just talked about, the fact is we're now a solid, a reliably solid Democratic bloc. And that has happened over the course of our lifetimes because of race and because of the way that, I mean, the biggest divide between people of color and whites in the US is really over 
what we think the role of government should be. Should we should the government be expansive and provide social services or not? And whites don't think so. And Asian Americans, blacks and Latinos do. So I think we're, you know, there's it, despite the fact that we're internally diverse, there's not a unifying message. We are seeing some consolidation around kind of bread and butter issues like healthcare, like the environment, like the role of government. That said, this is what is concerning to me. Much of the racial conservatism in our community is actually coming from out of this democratic consolidation. It is part and parcel. So what we're seeing is actually racially conservative Democrats having a lot of voice in the Asian American community. The people who, affirm, who are active around affirmative action do include a lot of Republicans, but also include people who haven't aligned with any party and those who are Democrats. This is not your typical right wing movement. And that is something that is very hard to get one's head around. And, and if I can add to that storytelling time, when Megan and I interviewed Asian Americans active in the affirmative action debate on all sides of the issue, um, I was shocked when I met um, really staunchly anti-affirmative action Chinese Americans in California, especially who, and these interviews that were happening in the summer and fall of 2016. Right. And so what was shocking was when I was interviewing these anti affirmative action folks, many of them were like, hey, you registered to vote. Are you going to vote for Hillary? You better be voting for Hillary. And then they would, you know, and they had their buttons and bumper stickers for Hillary. And um, and then right after that, they would tell me all about how affirmative action was anti Asian. And it just was so shocking. And then the reporter would turn off and they'd be like, you know, I really care about all these issues that Janelle just talked about with environmentalism and gun control. And I was just like, what is happening here? This is super complicated. And I'm um, struggling to wrap my head around it. If I'm struggling to wrap my head around it, I can't imagine any of these mainstream political parties leadership really like, oh, okay, there's something here that we need to, it's not just a one size fits all thing or, um, and at the same time, you know, I know we've been giving outsized interest, I think, to these racially conservative Asian Americans, but um, there are really exciting movements on the left. Um, I had a great conversation last week with Eileen Huang, who is a Yale student who started a project called the WeChat Project. Um, definitely look it up. And they are a group of young people, college students across the country who are really concerned about what's happening in WeChat. Um, and so they're writing essays, open letters to their parents. Um, and initially when Eileen wrote her letter about anti-blackness in the Chinese American community and sent it out on WeChat, um, there was a, the letter went viral. Um, there were, yes, definitely trolls who were really angry, but she said, she told me last week that the majority of the responses have been intergenerational and people have been reaching out to say, oh my gosh, it's about time someone said this. Thank you so much for this work. And so she's continuing this work into, she's taking a, um, uh, the next semester, half year to year to really invest in this project and, and mobilizing and, and um, organize her peers. Um, and it's really exciting work. It's the, it's the internal work that is necessary, but I think even with her, she was like, I was really surprised to get such encouragement um from within our community um and people saying to her like this helps me put words to what i've been seeing and worried about and so there are concerns but also there's really some good developments and leadership happening too i really like that example Oyan, of models for how Asian Americans can do politics. I think that is something that is maybe worth our discussion. Just how, how, are, the, how are different Asian Americans doing politics in a way that's really constructive and innovative? Um, I like that there is attention to intergenerational engagement. 
Um, and it makes me also think about the group that I always point to as offering a really inspiring model for how all Asian Americans, I think, should do politics. Um, and this is obviously a, a topic of my own research, but I'm really interested in how Hmong Americans do politics. Hmong Americans participate in politics um, at very high levels. They vote a lot, they organize a lot, they run for office a lot. A lot of their work is very intergenerational. Um, it's engaging their own family, organizing their own community. And one thing I think that is really distinctive is there is an embrace of politics as a way of advancing their interests and as a way of ensuring inclusion and participation in American society. I don't know if other ethnic groups in the United States have had such a positive view about political engagement uh, as Hmong Americans have, but, um, but I find them really a distinctive group uh, that offers, I think, a really interesting model for other communities to follow and perhaps Asian Americans writ large. Yeah, that's a great point, Melissa. I don't, um, in terms of mobilizing the Asian American community, we, we, maybe we're too close to it then. So we see the diversity, we see all the problems, but like Janelle said, we do have some galvanizing points of unity. And um, like Oyan talked about, I have noticed too how young people are really concerned about um, their parents and wanting to really speak to their parents and work in a unified fashion with their family. Right, and so that whole family orientation um, expands to the community of wanting us to work together collectively, holding um, a sense of balance and harmony and completeness in our political orientation. Um, another example is the Stop API Hate Youth Campaign, where the youth, the youth, the first thing they want to do is to start a social media campaign because that's all they know is the digital world and they're really active and very expert on it and i have no clue what they were doing and how they were going viral but they did um and thinking yeah asian americans have really used technology and um creative platforms really well as another new way of mobilizing um and to work intergenerationally um this this anti-asian hate moment I think has also really galvanized communities. So for example, I work a lot in the faith-based community and I've seen churches across theological divides come together for the first time to resist racism. So people recognize, well, this is wrong to have grandmas spit upon, you know, while they're walking their baby strollers. It's wrong that people on the subways get pushed and shoved. And so it's an easy issue actually to mobilize around. But what we're doing now at the moment is, um, what I think is really cool, so here's just another example of how Asian Americans are mobilizing. Um, we've seen patterns in history and we recognize that we actually do have a legacy of resistance. That even from the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese American incarceration, we've resisted all those cases of racism. And after 9-11, we saw how um, South Asians were racially profiled, detained, deported, had to register. And so now um, groups that we're working with in South API hate we're also using recent past history, um, anti-immigrant policies to try to come up with how do we develop proactive policies to address um, the racism and how do we um, fight against anti-immigrant policies um, being used and now actually implemented now with the second Chinese Exclusion Act of STEM students. And um, what I've noticed is that Asian Americans actually are pretty good at collaborating. So this is another strength, right? We have we're intergenerational concerns. We have great use of technology. And another way we can mobilize is actually, we're really trying to learn from um, the past and to collaborate. And um, I've seen data geeks come together with celebrities, working together with marketing executives, coming together to fight this racism. And I think they could come together in the same way to um, mobilize politically. And so um, this could be a, a, a moment where we develop new solidarities with new sort of political technologies um, that would be an Asian American way of doing politics versus using the old African American model of empowerment or the old white ethnic model. I, I, I appreciate that, Russell. I will say that some research shows um, this is a bit old now, but research coming out of the University of Chicago shows that 
um, this was an old youth study, um, so maybe things have changed, that Asian American young people had the most access to the internet, were on the internet the most, but engaged in political activism the least of any uh, group on the internet. And so that can be turned around, but it's obviously we need to do some work in our communities. Um, to Melissa's point about Hmong organizing and Hmong orientations toward politics, I mean, one of the things that I have so appreciated um, about the development of Hmong politics in the U.S. is really that they have, some of the organizations have been so intentional about um, forging, you know, Black Asian American campaigns and efforts. And that, I think, has become a model. When we look at the Prop 16 campaign to repeal uh, a ban on affirmative action in California, the leadership of that committee is intentionally Black civil rights activists, uh, Eva Patterson, and Vincent Pan from Chinese for Affirmative Action. And right now, the, uh, you know, there's lots of just great cross-racial mobilization happening there, including, you know, Andy Wong is the campaign uh, manager right now. So um, that, I think that visible Black Asian solidarity is something that is, is very aligned with the model we see coming out of um, the Hmong community. Two other things that are pretty interesting in this area are um, the role that international students can play. So we talk about, you know, kind of talking intergenerational, but also cross-national kind of um, mobilizations are really important right now. And some of you might have seen Alex Tom from Empowered Politics has organized um, Chinese international students to take part in a racial justice seminar. And it was pretty incredible. So, you know, that's a group that I think is both experiencing, as Russell says, a lot of racial profiling. But in the past, at my own university, there were complaints that Chinese international students were also, um, you know, engaging in some anti-Black um, commentary to other students. So I think, you know, there's, there's, this is a really important kind of area. We, I, I have always considered international students as part of our Asian American community. And I think that work is still really important. And then finally, to Russell's point, like, yeah, there's, you know, these intergenerational uh, conversations are really important, but it's also, I think Oyan and I have learned through our work um, with people who are active on WeChat, don't condescend to the first generation. We don't need to tell people what to think or what to do or how to understand necessarily race in the US. These are a highly educated population. And, you know, I think it's really important to know that we can also learn from the first generation about their own experiences with race and how they think it is best to outreach to other people who are first generation on issues of race. There tends to be this like uh, sense that because I think we're all in ethnic studies, like, oh, you know, the first generation that none of them have been exposed to ethnic studies. I do not, I don't think they have been exposed to ethnic studies necessarily, but I also don't think, I think it is wrong to say they don't understand race in America. The, uh, many conservatives understand race in America very well. They're just not making the choices that we are making. They quote Martin Luther King extensively because they're studying up on the aspects of the civil rights movement that they think works for them. And, but, but in terms of outreach, there's also a lot of, I mean, we have seen over the last five years, many, many people active on social media who are first generation immigrants. And this is actually not that new of a population. It's people who've been here for at least 15, often 25 years, right? Who are, are doing a lot of hard work every day to help to move their communities towards racial justice, to move our community as a whole towards racial justice. So, you know, I think this, there's the letters to the first generation are important, but also need to recognize that like we can't paint the whole first generation as one monolith that doesn't get it. That's not fair. Yeah. Um, thank you for that reminder, Janelle. Um, <laughs> taking it back to research and like the youth political engagement. Um, the, the research that Janelle, you were talking about, the updated research is that Asian American youth are the most likely to be online and connect, wired um, than any other racial group out there among young people 
Um, but while everyone else, the general population of youth, the more wired they are, the more likely they are to vote. That is not true for Asian Americans, unfortunately. So while we're seeing this mobilization on the ground of a lot of Asian American youth, um, I hope that that converts to also ballot box um, engagement as well. Um, so that said, um, I think, as Melissa, you mentioned, like this conversation is really highlighting how diverse um, this community of Asian Americans is. Um, and I think any efforts to mobilize or engage or communicate, I think what's really important is that I'm hearing both ethnic specific, um, generational specific, but then also, so then how do we get to this kind of unified agenda? Is there a unified agenda? It's kind of a yes and no, yes and both and kind of thing that we have to approach. Um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, South Asian Americans in particular have for decades been running these kind of youth summer political education programs. Like in the Bay Area, there's BASE, Bay Area Solidarity Summer. Um, here in Chicago, the program is called Chicago Youth, uh, Chicago Daisy Youth Rising, CEDAR. Um, and, you know, I think these are also really important spaces for political mobilization. But um, when I had approached one of the founders, Taz Ahmed, about like, hey, I'm seeing the, these problems within East Asian communities around um, racial politics and how did you do base and should we do a pan-Asian program? <laughs> she, I don't think she would mind me sharing this, but she was like, hey, you know what? The problem is in the Chinese community, the Chinese diaspora community, go get your people. <laughs> so she was like, that's how these South Asian summer youth program started was because they were seeing concerns within their ethnic specific, also pan-ethnic community. Um, and they mobilized at the grassroots level. And so um, I think in different ways from like Freedom Inc. to BASE to CEDAR to these other efforts, community-based efforts, um, it has to be both and, both ethnic specific, generational specific, and also cross-generational and pan-ethnic. And it's just a lot of work, but I, I see a lot of energy right now in this moment, and I hope that we can really capitalize on it and keep it moving. Oh, and then there's like all these Filipino youth organizations up and down the East Coast, like FIND and, um, oh my gosh, what is the one here in Illinois? Anyway, there's like a whole lot of youth based college student based organizations and collectives that are doing essentially political education for themselves that our universities and our schools are failing at for these diverse Asian American communities. Um, you know, I, and I also want to elevate the issue again of class diversity, because I do think so many of the issues that become Asian American issues are really centered on middle class, upper middle class issues. And um, I, more and more, I want to see the needs of like Burmese Americans uh, in Indiana, many of whom are it's working class and, and, and unionized. I mean, I want their issues to be centered in the, um, the agenda of the lo local politicians who are trying to reach out to them. Um, I want to return to something Janelle said about international students and a sort of general plea to have a sense of historical context here. Um, international students have a long history of playing a really critical role in pushing for progress in um, um, civil rights. Uh, so I think of Stephanie Hinnerschitt's work, for example, um, about Asian American students using both racial identity and religious identity to push forward a, a new agenda. Um, and also remembering that there's a long history of uh, political differences within ethnic communities. So all of these conversations about conservative and liberal Asian Americans today feel similar to the conversations I think about that occurred in the 40s and in the 50s. And so I think having a sense of how these issues in many ways are new, but also really, really old. Um, I'm intrigued because it's been such a momentous week. I do want to make space for us to talk about Kamala Harris. And I'm glad that Janelle pointed out that South Asians are the largest uh, Asian 
immigrant group in the United States or ethnic group in the United States. I should point out that because I um, work in Michigan and am a native Michigander, I pay attention to this a lot because Michigan's a swing state and the largest population, Asian American population in Michigan is Indian American. And I was really intrigued to see how the Indian American community in that key state is responding to the announcement of Kamala Harris's Joe Biden's PP. So um, I'm interested to see what the organizing looks like on the ground with that. And I will point out um, that there already is an Asian Pacific American sort of policy agenda laid out by the Biden campaign. I didn't see one in the Trump campaign website, but I didn't look at the website as closely as I, as I maybe should have in advance of this discussion. I just kind of want to know what people's thoughts are. Um, and, I, and I think we are kind of limited on time, so we can offer closing thoughts <laughs> on Kamala Harris and everything. Yeah, well, I'm really excited about the Kamala Harris um, Biden ticket. Um, actually, um, so she grew up in this black Baptist church, which is four blocks from where I live and um, that my church partners with often. Um, I was that little Chinese boy bust, just like she was that little black girl bust. Um, and so I, I feel a kinship. I think um, one thing I just sort of just reflected on is I think Kamala actually took the black route of empowerment. Um, she really played the insider game. She did the Howard University um, sorority sister approach to um, building connections within um, the African-American community and then worked within the democratic um, infrastructure to work her way up and had mentors and um, guides. I think for Asian-Americans who, who um, at this moment, I think are really struck because um, we're, we're still portrayed as perpetual foreigners and this anti-Asian hate has really sort of pushed us back from being crazy rich Asians to crazy infected Asians from model minorities to perpetual foreigners, right? So now we're on the outside and we're saying, do we belong in America because we're outside threats? And then we look at Kamala Harris and look at the white black divide and are we complicit with white supremacy? Are we aligned with Black Lives Matter? Do we look like Kamala Harris? No. And so I think for Asian Americans, this question of belonging to America is a big one that's been historic. Right? We've always been trying to fight for entrance into um, gaining whiteness in terms of status and power and belonging in terms of rights and citizenship. But we don't want to be white. I want to make that clear. I don't, I don't know any Asian American who wants to be white. We just want whiteness and that status and power and privilege and wealth um, in general. So Asian Americans, I think at this moment, even with Kamala Harris being on the ticket still feel like this sense of, for me, being on the outside, looking in, wanting to belong, neither white nor black, no longer the model minority, but now the perpetual foreigner. And I think um, the question is that I always pose to young people, my students now, do we really want to belong to the America the way it is, the way it used to be? Um, how do we reimagine America that we want to belong to and then um, join in to making better? I don't believe in the Andrew Yang approach where we have to prove ourselves. We do belong, but um, I always question, do we want to belong to this America at this moment? That was so poignant, Russell. And um, I think, you know, you capture our positionality in the U.S. racial landscape and in the electoral landscape is really defined by these tensions over belonging. And uh, Kamala Harris immediately was charged with um, not belonging on the basis of having immigrant parents, right, and that um, birtherism conspiracy. And so I think on the one hand, I see a lot of excitement exactly like you, um, like you mentioned about her Asian, American, and Black heritage. At the same time, you know, research in our community shows that uh, just exactly as Melissa started us off with, that we are such a socially constructed community that there's always contention over who belongs with 
in Asian America. And so, you know, but the last study my colleagues and I did in 2016 showed that uh, particularly East Asians were, they were asked like, do you think that South Asians and Southeast Asians are Asian, are Asians, right? Are Asian Americans. And there's a lot of variation. So South Asians historically have actually said, yeah, we're Asian American. They identify as Asian American at the same rate as other Asian Americans. But East Asians are more likely to say that other Asian groups that aren't East Asian are not Asian American. And so we really need to contend with um, the, just, I think all, it, all that really does is show like this is a contested category and belonging matters both within our group and outside of our group. I will say that as a final kind of commentary on this, um, you know, important discussion about diversity, there, there are ties that bind. And despite the fact that we are so diverse, it's kind of remarkable that we are, we have these kinds of conversations and that there is, um, a, there is a coming together in some ways around um, racial identity and around a set of political issues. Like we always concentrate on all of these divisions, but in fact, despite these divisions, you, there is a there there. And I just want to kind of remind us of that. To carry with that, um, Melissa, I think you just recently had like a pop culture conversation recently. And I was just thinking about the popularity of Never Have I Ever on Netflix and Indian matchmaking um, and how amongst my Asian American friends, people are seeing like who are not South Asian American, they're seeing kind of, they're feeling something that it is intangible, right? Uh, that I think speaks to a little bit about like, what is Asian America, right? Like, um, and I always, it, it's this, it's so fascinating to hear like East Asians are essentially kind of patrolling the borders of what is Asian America and disturbing at the same time, um, especially when, and this is exactly why in some of my classes, I love just throwing in Google Asian in the UK and then hit the images and all you see are South Asian faces. Um, and so just to really demonstrate how socially constructed Asian is, right? Um, or Asian American is. And so um, I'm, I have so many mixed emotions about Kamala. <laughs> um, but something I'm not mixed on is how excited I am that my five-year-old daughter who is starting kindergarten in a pandemic remotely whole another story, um, is really excited to say an Asian American woman, doesn't matter if she doesn't look like me, um, but my, you know, my daughter who is Chinese and Thai is just like, you know, just like me, she's Asian, she identifies as Asian American, and that's amazing. Um, <laughs> it helps that Kamala has a phenomenal children's book. <laughs> so my, it was one of my, my child's favorite books out there, but what a, fun, what a, what a moment, right? Because Cami Duckworth, who is also part Thai, like my child, um, was also considered for the VEEP position. And so um, I feel like we're having lots of moments. I'm, I was going to say moment, but we're having lots of cultural and political and social moments right now that I think, like Russell, you said, this is a great moment to really reimagine um, what it is, our, uh, the future of um, our society, our communities, how we politically engage. Um, I think it's just a really exciting moment and, um, and concerning and worrying. And just, I'm gonna end with the exciting. So I think we're getting pretty close to time. Maybe we can go one more time around and we can share final thoughts as well as a reminder of um, where people can find us. Um, so, Oyan, you're right, and you totally outed me as someone who watches maybe way too much TV. Um, but in the context of <laughs> in the context of a pandemic, it does feel like the responsible thing to do is stay home, watch all the things on Netflix that involve Asian Americans, and call that research. So that is my research agenda at, at this moment. Um, but I, I think this is a really powerful moment. You're right, culturally for Asian Americans and politically. Asian Americans are more visible than ever before on screen, in our politics, 
And yet at the same time, we still remain invisible. And I think that is the thing that's so hard at this moment. We are getting a lot of attention. We're in positions of leadership and prominence. And yet people forget to mention that Kamala Harris is Asian American when they talk about her. And people forget to, I don't know, uh, include Asian Americans in their voter outreach in their campaigns. Um, I see that all the time still. So I think this is a transition moment. I think the key is for Asian Americans to decide how they want to organize themselves, how they want to identify themselves, what they want to identify as Asian American issues that are going to unite them in addition to any ethnic specific issues. I think we have a lot to say about the future of Asian American politics. And I think it's really important to sort of claim agency in this moment. Um, and, and once again, I'm Melissa Borja, uh, assistant professor, University of Michigan, um, apparently Netflix scholar, uh, also a researcher with Stop API Hate. Um, and you can find me um, sort of at the University of Michigan's website and also probably at home watching Never Have I Ever and the Babysitter's Club a lot because hashtag Claudia Kishi is queen. <laughs> well, we've been binging on Netflix K-dramas and I've noticed my Asian American outsider status because I watch K-dramas. And for the first time in my life, I'm saying, I sort of look like that actor who is sort of attractive. I'm not as attractive, but I sort of am close to that kind of level of attractiveness. Whereas growing up, when I looked at white actors or African Americans, I had no connection at all. And so now I'm actually engaged in the love relationships of people on screen. And I think, oh, now I know why representation matters so much to people. Um, because before, I wasn't represented, and I didn't relate, and I just sort of checked out. Um, so Crash Landing on You is still the best one um, that we've seen so far. Um, I guess closing comments in terms of uh, representation and issues. I'm more concerned actually about the issues and how we're represented or how we're perceived or how we identify. I am really concerned about the, the concrete issues that Asian Americans are experiencing right now. Um, because of COVID-19, um, people are afraid of the pandemic, people are afraid, Asian Americans are afraid of the, the parents and their elderly relatives will get the pandemic, so we're doubly stressed. We're also more economically disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because of boycotts of Asian businesses, because of the large proportions of Asians in the service sector, Asian restaurants, Asian nail salons, those who are hotel workers, essential workers, they were laid off earlier. They may not have access to stimulus checks and they're gonna stay unemployed longer. Um, so uh, the pandemic already has had devastating impacts on our ethnic enclaves and then that will have ripple effects on the Asian American community. So, so we're worried economically. And fourthly, we're again worried um, because of racism. And I think it's just a matter of time when someone actually will see another Vincent Chin attack. And we're gonna have to respond, or there'll be a mass shooting um, because that's because hate's been normalized at this moment. And uh, so I think what may galvanize um, Asian Americans more than having a symbolic leader like Kamala Harris, more than having an identity like Asian Americans who are disenfranchised would be maybe, um, for me, what I really care about is let's galvanize around the issues that matter um, to our concrete day-to-day -day lives, our health, our economics, um, our education and our family. And I think uh, that's what Asian Americans care about, those bread and butter issues. And I think, uh, that's the way we engage them. I'm Dr. Russell Jung. You can reach me at rjung at sfsu.edu. And if you have experienced any anti-Asian hate, um, I really encourage you to report to Stop AAPI Hate. Thanks for this opportunity and thanks for the conversation. I'd also like to thank everyone for the conversation. My name is Janelle Wong and you can find me at, at prof Janelle Wong on Twitter. And I'm Oyan Poon, and you can find me on Twitter at Spam Fried Rice. I'm never going professional with that handle, by the way. So that's that. Um, but I think Russell just ended really beautifully, so I, I won't add anything further.
Thank you for watching Coffee Breaks with Scholars, presented by the Diversity Scholars Network and the National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan. For more information about the Diversity Scholars Network, visit lsa.umich.edu slash ncid or email diversityscholars at umich.edu.